Hey folks, George here again. This time we're going to continue our discussion around the moral issues regarding abortion. Now we're going to examine a famous article by Judith Jarvis Thompson entitled, A Defense of Abortion. She comes at it from a very interesting viewpoint. Uh, last time we discussed the debate whether or not the fetus is a person with moral rights. Judith Jarvis Thompson is going to bring up another point such that it doesn't matter if the fetus is a person. We'll see how that argument works right now. She starts her article off early by saying, I am inclined to think also that we shall probably have to agree that the fetus has already become a human person well before birth. Indeed, it comes as a surprise when one first learns how early in its life it begins to acquire human characteristics. She gives us the presumptive right to life argument. That argument suggests that a fetus is a person. Every person has a right to life, so a fetus has a right to life. And that right to life outweighs a woman's desires about her own body. However, Thompson brings in a now famous example of a violinist. Imagine that while you're asleep, a dying violinist is connected to your body to keep him alive. Must you accept the situation to keep the violinist alive? By the way, this sounds a lot like becoming pregnant as a result of rape. Some pro-lifers make exceptions for rape. However, Judith Jarvis Thompson sees that as odd. That seems to suggest that some people have less a right to life, and that is rather unpleasant. When you say, wait a second, I thought a fetus had a right to life. Yeah, but if it's the product of rape, it has less of a right to life? That uh, is rather unpleasant to Thompson and to myself. Let's go back to the uh, extreme pro-life view that there shall be no abortions, even to save the mother's life. With that in mind, Thomas says, even if the fetus has a right to life, so does the mother. There is no reasonable way to consider abortion as murder if it is to save a mother's life. By the way, all reasonable morality allows for self-defense. And it allows others, like doctors or like policemen, to help others secure their self-defense. So in this case, it seems completely absurd to uh, Thompson to say that there are never any exceptions even for the mother's life. So with that in mind, let's examine this notion of a right to life, right? What does a right to life mean? not mean? Well, Thompson says it doesn't mean that when I have a right to life, therefore I have a right to do whatever I want to another person's body to keep me alive. Back to her famous violinist example. Clearly, the violinist has a right to life, but the violinist does not have a right to be connected to me. Again, uh, we've talked about this regarding libertarian arguments who suggest that, uh, yes, right to life is a negative right, such that I have a right that you shall not do anything to me, right? Uh, versus positive rights, uh, such that I have a right to something you must give me. Again, if we recall certain libertarian arguments from other discussions, or maybe we will discuss uh, in the future other libertarian arguments, they'll say that there are indeed negative rights, but it's the positive rights which are much, much more controversial, right? And that is all that Thompson is suggesting. At the very least, I have negative rights not to be bothered by other people who want to force upon me my duty to save them by connecting to my body, let's say. So then, what does all that mean? Let's figure out what right to life really means. Right to life really means the right to not be killed unjustly. 
That's what right to life really means. Bringing it back to abortion, like the violinist, the fetus, even if it is a person, let's assume for the sake of this article that it is a person, the fetus has a right to life. But is abortion unjust killing? In the case of rape, obviously, the mother has not given the fetus a right to use her body. So at the very least, uh, so far, Thompson has given us a good argument to suggest why abortion, in the case of rape, shall be allowed. Because if a fetus has a right to life, it doesn't have a right to my body that I gave unjustly, right? Well then, uh, fine. A lot of people aren't too happy with that though, because what kind of pregnancy might a fetus have the right to a mother's body? Well, what if the mother freely chose to have sex, which led to pregnancy, but she didn't want pregnancy? That's an interesting one, right? However, Thompson has a way out of that. She says, wait, if I leave the window open in my home and a burglar comes in, it's absurd to say that the burglar has rights over my property just because I left the window open. And presumably that analogy goes to uh, having sex, but not wanting a baby after having sex, right? In the same way that just because I leave my door unlocked or my window open, it doesn't mean that the burglar that shows up that I don't want to show up has any rights to my property simply because I left the window open, right? And that's where Thompson is going to go a bit further and say, yeah, the right to abortion is going to be a little bit more broad than merely rape, right? Let's reconsider the violinist example, right? Of course, Thompson acknowledges it would be nice to help him. Maybe you even ought to help him. You should help the violinist. But even if I ought to help, that doesn't give the violinist a right to my help. Even if it is morally good that I do help, that doesn't mean the violinist has the right to take that help from me. And so for a fetus, right? So for a fetus, even if it is easy for me to do, it still does not yield someone else's right to me and my body, right? Nobody is morally required to make large sacrifices in order to keep another person alive. We are not morally required to be good Samaritans. Therefore, there is no injustice to disconnecting the violinist or having an abortion. Now, Thompson is very clear. This doesn't prove that all abortion is always permissible, right? There might be, as even Warren acknowledged, some very um, indecent abortions. Yes? She's not, Thompson isn't. Thompson isn't arguing for an absolute right to an abortion. All that said, however, Thompson does bring back uh, from where she started earlier in the article when she said, yeah, it's clear that a fetus is a person. At the end of the article, she says, yeah, but by the way, we've all just been pretending that a fetus is a person from conception. So perhaps further down the way of a development, the fetus might become a person or something like a person, but certainly not a zygote, right? Or very early stages of uh, pregnancy. That, to me, is a fascinating argument that Thompson has given us to explain even if the fetus does have a right to life, that doesn't preclude the right to uh, an abortion. It might still allow for abortion rights, even if fetuses have rights to life, just like the violinist. Hope that summarizes for you a lot of Thompson's arguments and you have a better understanding of her ideas there. Again, if you disagree with her, where does she go wrong in her reasoning and argumentation? See you next time. Bye-bye.